I'm going to pop over to the shading tab. The shading tab shows you that everything comes with this default principle BSDF material. It is going to be able to calculate the light that bounces off into and through a surface. This is kind of like the AI standard. It's a very basic and default shader. We have our material output here. All the information of this shader is going through this little noodle here and plugging into the material output. The material output is assigned to the geometry. So if I change the color here, you can see that that information is traveling through the noodle and into the surface input of the material output. There's also the volume input. That's for stuff like smoke and fog and clouds and that kind of thing. And then there's the displacement input, which is actually going to influence where these vertices actually are in 3D space. For now, we're just going to focus on the surface aspect of the material. This is pretty self-explanatory, especially if you have any shading experience. If I increase the metallic on it, it becomes a more metallic reflection model. And if I decrease the roughness, then it becomes extremely shiny. Roughness is an implementation of the Oranayer shader, which basically were two scientists that created a research paper that said that we can calculate how things reflect off of surfaces if we pretend that there's a billion tiny little microscopic spheres on the surface. And how high the roughness value is, is how far they extrude from the surface, creating a microscopic bump to it, just a little, brrr, you know, just a stuff that you wouldn't even really be able to feel with your fingertips. It's smaller than that, but that is actually how the reflectance model really emulates real life physics. If you have this tiny little micro surface here that when light comes down and hits that surface, it's going to bounce and scatter into different directions, disrupting the reflection, right? So even though on a macro level, it might look quite smooth, like let's say something like this leather book. You know, I can feel it. It's very smooth, but I can't see my face in the reflection. That's because the microsurface is super bumpy. And this roughness value is actually the, the value to which we are creating that microsurface roughness, that microsurface bumpiness. And the higher it is, the more and more it starts to look like powder right? until it, it actually looks like a powder ball. And it kind of loses its reflective properties. It kind of looks less metallic as well. I mean, I guess it's still a little bit metallic -y, but it, it looks a bit weird, right? And as I decrease this, we can see that oh, it gets really crisp and really shiny as it shows the environment map here. We also have cool things like the clear coat, right? So we can have a high level of roughness and we can also have a clear coat on top of that that is shinier than what's underneath. So it looks like, let me just increase this roughness a lot higher. You can see that we have this film on top of it. It's like a lacquer. This is really nice for more complex materials. You may have a wood table. Maybe it's like a, you know, like a brown color and it has a lacquer on top of it that is far less rough. And you can see how there's two, there's kind of two highlights now. There's, there's, if I turn it off, you see this soft one. And then when I turn this on, you can see that there's a super sharp one and we can kind of set those two together until we get this really nice multi-layered specular shader. This is good for cars. This is good for anything that has multiple layers of specularity. Index of refraction, we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive on later, but this does set the rate at which things are going to transmit as light transmits through the object. What's nuts about all this, this shader node editor is so freaking powerful. It can do so much. We can actually rebuild the entire principal BSDF shader without even using it at all with individual nodes. So you can hit add and you can use this menu or I just hit shift A and then search and I can do a refraction BSDF and that is just the refraction part of the shader. There's no reflection there. And if I add a glossy BSDF, well then that is just going to be the glossiness. It's just going to be the reflection. If I use a shift A add shader, I can add these two shaders together and I'm essentially recreating the principal BSDF, right? Step by step. I've got them both now. I can also add a color here, it's diffuse BSDF. And I'll create a add shader and I'll add this one to that one, I plug that one into there and then plug that one into there. I can actually step by step recreate the entire BSDF shader and, you know, 
back before Blender had the principal BSDF shader, this is basically what it was. It was a whole bunch of separate nodes. And now you can just start with the principled, which has all of them in it already. But what's crazy about this is that it gives you a, an incredible amount of control. And this does translate to a lot of other software, including metaverse platforms like 3JS, which is the JavaScript that runs 3D models through the browser. 3JS will convert this to one of their shaders, which it will read the color it will read the specular roughness. It will read all that stuff. It won't be exactly the same, but you can make shaders in here and then export them into GLB files. And those GLB files will be read by metaverse platforms and they will understand what the color is. They'll understand what the bump map is. They'll understand all that stuff. You know, using this as, as a default is really useful if you're planning to leave Blender. But a lot of people never do leave Blender because you don't have to, because you can do all your rendering in either real time or in cycles. So talking about our render engines. We have Eevee, which is basically a video game rendering engine, which is all real time. And we have Cycles as the actual ray tracing engines. So we're going to actually get bounce light. These shaders are going to be applicable through Cycles and through Eevee. They're going to look a little bit different in terms of the lighting. And some of the calculation is going to be a little bit different, but it's incredible what you can do with these materials for either Cycles or Eevee. I hit new material and then I'll call this, you know, sphere. Comes with the principal BSDF by default, right? So there's the texture coordinate node, shift A, S for search, type in texture coordinate. And this is going to provide either UV space, cameras. Can I ask mm -hmm. you a question? Of course. Factor is like the weight. Yeah. Okay. And one more question, like the texture coordinate mm -hmm. is like, it works like in substance when we have UV projection or tripolanar. Totally. Yes. It is like the, the substance painter yeah. projection it settings. It's like a projection. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. No worries. Let's, if you go to edit preferences, add-ons, you can type in materials and you can turn on the material utilities add-on. It comes with Blender. You already have it. You don't need to download it, but it makes it really useful because you can hit shift Q and you get this select by material, assign material, clean slots. You can clean the material slots that aren't being used. And so I will assign, let's see, by material and I'll add a different material to that. So now I have a different material on the same object. And I can just you see that there's slot one and slot two and slot three. And just hitting minus will erase them. So if I want to get rid of the glass one, I get rid of the glass one or, or vice versa. So you can have multiple materials on the same object. What you'll notice here is that there's this zero next to some of these materials. That means nothing in the scene is using it, which means that when you close Blender, it's just going to delete them, right? So if I make a whole bunch of materials and then stop assigning them to things. You can see there's a whole bunch of materials on here. Blender will automatically just delete these when you close Blender. They're stored in memory. They're not stored on the file. Even if I hit save, so if I file save as, it's not, if it's not assigned to a user, like a sphere or an, an object of some type, it's not, it's not going to keep them. So it keeps files extremely efficient and extremely light in that way. It kind of automatically cleans stuff up. So if I pop back over to my this this homework assignment that we had, right, and I'll just pop into Eevee here and I'll turn off my wireframe and I'll look at that. I the homework assignment for this week is to create four different materials. So right now we have a chrome one and we have a gray ball and those are nice, but I would like to see four different materials of very different material variety assigned to spheres. So I'm going to duplicate this and duplicate this, duplicate this and duplicate this. And you'll notice that my three point lighting isn't flawless anymore because I probably need to, you know, like scale these down so they fit in the same, in the same area as where my three point lighting is working. And, or I need to scale up my whole studio to accommodate. Just put these right on the ground, crash them through just a tiny bit. Right, just a teeny, teensy, tiny bit. And to each one of these, I'm going to create a new material. So I'm going to go to my object and I don't want the background mat on that. Oops, I selected the background, I think. I'm going to assign the background to the background. But this one, I'm going to delete and I'm going to call this gold. And that means it's going to be a metallic at 100%. And it's going to be like this color. And if you want to get super fancy, then you can start to 
add in some noise maps, like a noise texture here. Oh, the other one that I, I wanted to show you was the, the, the Voronoi texture. Really, really nice. So if I type in, oops, shift A, search Voronoi. And I'll just use plug this into the roughness. And you can see if I hit control B, I'll create this little render region of just this area. So it's not rendering everything. I can scale this up and the randomness is at a good level, but it can create a lot of very interesting shapes. And it might be faster if I just plug this straight into the surface, just so we can see what it's doing. If I scale this up like crazy, I should get this nice little breakup, this little noise. And if it's not random, you get these little squares, right? But I want them to be all kind of random shaped. It's nice and organic. And that's just going to break up my roughness a little bit. And I can also plug this into a curves because you can see it's a little too extreme right now. Like if I just plug this in and wait for it to finish or just do this little section here, you can see that the difference between like very rough and not very rough is a little too much. So I want it to be, nothing is perfectly mirror, but a lot of this stuff is going to be real, real, real shiny, but it's just a little bit of variation. And that gives me that surface detail. Even that is probably too much. How do I delete these guys? Oh, this little X. Yeah, it's like this one and this one hit the X. And just a little bit of variation in there. It's a little bit shiny. But you can see it's got that really fine grain detail in there. And maybe I'll just take this and I'll, I'll do a mix RGB, which is another one that I really wanted to show you. Drag and drop it into here so it automatically plugs in. And I'll do a noise texture, shift to A search noise texture and i'll plug that one into the color here and just to see what it's doing i'll plug this into the surface and roughness now we'll we'll leave the roughness like that scale will have real low so it's like a, a real big blobby thing and then we can set kind of the amount of how much of each one of these we're going to be seeing and hell we can even plug in another noise texture to run that and you can see how these like, they very quickly start to become complex. And I'll create a RGB curves to make this higher contrast, right? So some areas are going to show the one and other areas are going to show the other. I don't want it to be that high contrast though. I just want it to break up a little bit. And then when, by the time I plug this in, we're going to have this like really organic procedural metal shader. And obviously any one of these curves or noises can be manipulated and, and edited in order to get the result that you're looking for, depending on what your reference looks like. So if I'm like looking at, these are all CG, so I want to avoid them, but something like this, you know, we can see it's a way higher roughness value. It's way darker inside of the crevices. So I might want to use some type of cavity map in here. There are some lower roughness areas, but you know, I could actually really fine tune this whole thing. I'm actually going to type in RGB curves here and make the whole thing darker based off of that reference. This value needs to be darker too. Probably a slightly less saturated, not that much. Probably a little more yellow, a little less shiny, but saturation needs to come back up. And I can fine tune this thing until I get damn close to the reference. And, and none of these nodes are like really complex, but you can see how this graph starts to really expand. The homework assignment is to create these four different materials. So I would say gold, you can do a rubber, you can do a glass, you can do a, a like if I add a material here, like a tire material would be high in roughness and it would be very dark and would be great to add some procedural tread marks and grids on that kind of thing. This one, I would say uh, using that glass dispersion one, lots of different stuff that you can do. So explore, if you want to do the Studio Ghibli thing, do the Studio Ghibli thing, like make a procedural painted rock material. And we'll take a look at what your materials look like next week before we start diving into unwrapping and texturing. Any questions? Maybe I have one. So is there a way, for example, if I create a shader on one scene and I want to export the material to for another scene, can I do it? 
Of course, of course, you can export out the blend file. You can export out a FBX with the material on it. Like if you export out the object with the material on it, but also the new thing that Blender 3.0 offers is the asset library. So I haven't used this yet. So let me just experiment with it. But if I have the shader editor and I'll just make a new window here, ha, did it on the first try asset browser. And I want to export this gold here. I think there's a way to do it. Is it from here? Mark as asset. Yeah. So if I right click on it in the outliner and I think, I don't think it works down here. Yeah. If I right click on it in the outliner, I'll just call this gold ball, gold ball. I can mark as asset. And yeah, it puts this little asset library icon on it and it's currently unassigned. It's in here. It should, let me see if I drag and drop it into that space. Is it, does it keep its? Yeah, it does keep its material. Yeah. It should also display its material. It shouldn't be great. Oh, blender crash. Oops. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. But this is a solution for sure. Yeah. yeah I, will, and I will explore. And I haven't updated my Blender. We're at 3.1 already. I'm still on 3.0. So, and the asset library was brand new in 3.0. So I'm sure that that crash has probably already been fixed. I just haven't updated my Blender. But yeah, marking things as assets mm -hmm. is incredibly useful. And that goes back to what we were talking about, neutral look dev environments in the beginning. If you have everything shaded in the same environment and you have this massive asset library that's embedded into Blender, then you can always just drag and drop materials and assets and characters and props and all that kind of stuff from any scene that you're working on moving forward. Great, Connor. Thank you so much. No worries.